Thank you very much for uh, this interesting presentation. Since we have heard a lot about temporality, about ephemerality, and the document status of art, but also select selection criteria for preservation and conservation. We now have a new aspect here, um, the, the process of uh, telling, of sharing stories. Maybe you can elaborate on what that means for the preservation of art. No, that's a question to everybody, right? No, we'll get to that in a minute. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, the selection and the preservation of objects. I think we need to distinguish this is, has been reinforced by the digital sphere. So this uh, latency and this latency period of works, also of uh, data, this is something that archivists uh, study because they have to uh, take care of that. They need to make sure things are archi archived so that they continue to exist. So they are professionally involved in a process of caring of handling that and on the other side uh, there is what can be prepared for uh, people to actually experience that in that uh, case the narrative will be a different one so I think it really uh, depends on what we're talking about uh, as I was saying critically Louvre things need to be archived and capped you need to be able to go uh, there and uh, an object of arts need to be needs to be located people need to know where it is so um, uh, the retelling of a narrative uh, plays a big, uh, a smaller role. I talked about this uh, general audience that creates a memory by that. So maybe this is about contextualizing uh, uh, objects of art. Exactly, of them telling us a story or of them suddenly telling a story again after having been quiet for a while. So if you update the latency period, if, they, if you take these art works of art out of uh, storage, there will be different aspects and perspectives, and you will might see, oh, this past actually has a, a future, which happened in the case of El Greco, who through expressionism was seen as, uh, was rediscovered. So there are many um, uh, examples for that. Suddenly something turns into a true uh, force, which was um, unforeseeable, actually. So it's basically in some kind of interplay with uh, play with the, uh, with the public. Does somebody want to say something about that? And if not, I would just give the floor to each and every one of you to get your thoughts. Let's start with Ms. Artak. You, as an artist, you are an act, actually an active artist. I, I can now finally ask you, what would you like uh, to have as um, dura duration for your work? What what do you strive for? We joked about that earlier. Of course, I want my works to be uh, preserved as long as possible. I want them to outlive me. That's basically it. That is some claim that I have, some expectation. Something I'm interested in as an artist is to make visible what is not visible anymore. Something that has uh, made its mark on a certain location without leaving any trace. So, so and, and if that hadn't happened, there would, have, would be nothing for me to make visible and during a conference I reflected upon that I wondered if that it is and that if that is part of my task and it's actually archives uh, archive material that slumbers somewhere I think that's uh, key it's important to bring that back into the light and to make it accessible uh, to people and in doing so uh, so the spaces where I were uh, I work to give them a historical dimension and to take that into the present. And how do you make sure that the material will survive? Just very simply, is uh, I do consider the durability of the material that I, I work with, that I use. So I don't think we need to go back to bronze, but it actually is something I do consider when planning my objects of art.
the presentation by Linus Norman was very interesting. It resonated with me because it was something totally different. This is about an ephemeral um, intervention in present, some activism-based um, action. So and I also wondered how uh, the work of the Red Floor uh, might uh, be continued uh, 100 years uh, later and how we can archive things uh, uh, so that even maybe in 100 years somebody will stumble upon it and think, oh, that's that's interesting. How can I make this accessible for to the, to the present time? Let me now continue. Let's uh, ask uh, but this is about an underrepresented area that it's very important for the conservation of art and uh, which makes archiving possible in the first place. This is about restoring. Let's ask the restorer, would, would you like to see if, in terms of durability? What would you wish to, what would you expect from active artists to even allow for durability in the first place? Let me start with something, saying something by saying something else. I heard a lot today, interesting presentations, and uh, there were some buzzwords, restoration, conservation, perspectives, there was a long list, but restoration was actually underrepresented today, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to share my thoughts on that. There's one thing we're certainly not, that had been mentioned several times, let's say there's a problem and now let's fix it, dear restorer, this is not how, this is not... Uh, the box in which we would like to be put by by people, so that really doesn't reflect the uh, the, the current uh, training and the vocational profile. Coming back to your question, I'm very pleased uh, that there is an artist who actually um, studies uh, material and uh, the maintenance of materials, and I actually do believe that uh, there can be two aspects to this issue. You would like for your works uh, to be preserved, and in that case it is important to look into the kind of material you will be using, using it not only superficially, and that you actually select materials that will uh, allow for this uh, intended durability. There are some artists, obviously, out uh, there who um, study the process of, of change, of evolvement, that's also a legitimate aspect, but I think there needs to be a strict line uh, between what is doable and uh, the things, uh, materials that are good for durability and that there are others that even if you use them to the best of, the, of your knowledge that are just not uh, appropriate that cannot be maintained and those those include, this includes a lot of materials, of combination of materials that certainly won't work over time, that will not outlast their creators so if you think of, of all those media and all these computer issues, digital storage, um, and um, sometimes we just transfer things into different uh, formats. And I think we need to make a clear distinction here between these different areas. And um, I think it's important for um, uh, artists to look into uh, materials and the durability of the materials they are going to use in, in their work. And as a, as a restorer, this will be really helpful, and I welcome uh, this initiative or, or this step taken by artists, So, because this will be key for, um, for the renovation and for the restoration. My experience here has shown, shown that many artists um, aren't really too keen about that. They um, feel, feel like we're being a little, a little bit pushy about the material that they should, should use. So um, I do um, do not have the impression that they appreciate uh, that uh, that a lot. So maybe uh, in in the future this will be um, a different situation, and this might uh, we might be able to do a better job in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much about the, for this important statement. This is highly relevant. Let me now turn to you, Ms. Anonko, as a member of the advisory committee. 
als Architektin? Not as an architect, but in your role as a member of the supervisory uh, uh, committee uh, or the advisory committee. What, what about the client side? What is the client side willing to do to make things uh, durable? Was? Weil ich denke, das ist ein ganz wichtiger Punkt. Because I think this is an important issue. If you're not going to just talk what about is there already, but if you actually make the commissions and before you start, what are you willing to do? Maybe more money for material, um, more money for maintenance. Well, I'm not really the client, actually. We, we can try to have an influence on them, but this is an interesting question. And maybe this symposium today can actually um, uh, slightly shift this question. I found it very interesting to see that uh, works of art have uh, or expect a different life expectancy, so to say. It would be uh, fascinating to see maybe to have competitions where we would actually um, require uh, people or give the opportunity to artists uh, of saying, of telling us uh, for uh, what time period their art is intended. So that would be an option. This might be worth exploring. And that, that's something that ha hasn't really been on, on our minds during our discussions. That uh, We always talk about materiality, vandalism, that's also a, always a big issue but um, it was uh, nice to see that there's a different angle to this ask. some people might want their uh, art to be for forever for eternity and others well actually in the public space if you do a public art it, this actually is an issue eternity yes I, I agree and this issue is seen from different angles by different artists we also have temporary interventions in public space uh, sometimes people say well three years three years would be a good time period and it uh, would really be a powerful statement and in public space what what is relevant is to um, create a feedback uh, loop I think that's something we neglected uh, towards the end I think uh, it's important that something happens in public space when there is art uh, public uh, art something actually happens an intervention generates and creates something so it's important to serve a certain setting and an environment or to provoke something to create some sort of attention or feedback. Maybe it's a pleasant feeling, but any kind of reaction is what we want to um, reach through a public art. So coming back to the original to the issue I think the time aspect is something that we uh, could actually claim or ask or require the the artists to to tell us about and then the material could be adapted accordingly and of course money is always an issue and the use that we make of the money and I think public art and the art itself it's ultimately all about um, reaching the full its full potential and maybe the artists are uh, better placed to guide these um, aspects and, and how, how that would, will evolve uh, in, in public space yes I, I, I do believe if wherever conservation is an issue, money needs to uh, uh, be spent. What we have been doing recently, of course, there are aggravating factors and everybody's talking about it. Sure, climate change is related to, uh, to art and it is certainly an aggravating factor because we have to be prepared for that. Uh, lots, lots of rainfall, uh, periods of uh, hot weather and drought. So all that does something to public art. So coming back to the issue of money, 
especially for public art that actually needs some uh, kind of um, assistance and care, I think monitoring project programs will be uh, necessary and maintenance. I think that's more important than specific processes of restoration. I think we need to um, look into how we are going to actually do that. Uh, let me add something to that from uh, my experience and uh, by working in the advisory committee for every competition, for every project, we at the committee ask uh, ourselves how long will this work of art last? We address this issue for every work of art and um, so this that was oftentimes a very um, strong argument uh, for or against. Um, so archiving uh, the present, let me just briefly touch upon uh, this issue. Let me share a sensation, I've been uh, an emotion I've been feeling uh, this day. I felt that some errors were being um, hit, hit, were hitting me, uh, great, great thoughts by great minds, and I had some light bulb moments and some of these stuck and uh, you probably had other light bulb moments. So yeah. let me just share what uh, struck me as I was listening to all of you earlier today. So archiving uh, the present, and I just uh, learned that from Mr. Rick, uh, now is has just passed. So we will now have to be, we, we should be discussing the archiving of uh, the current uh, event we're at. So you have to destroy something to create art. That's what Linus Neumann said earlier, and Mr. Dye repeatedly said something that uh, resonated with me. He uh, uh, talked about disposing of uh, things. If something is disposed of, all your worries will be gone. This is a word play in German that doesn't uh, translate well. So we uh, so there is uh, this um, of course this idea of triage of uh, separating um, uh, things. That's something that uh, is a term we widely used during the pandemic in the medical sphere. We also talked about over archiving, which I found fascinating. And uh, all day I've been this time factor has been and the issue a lot of. Well, the speakers addressed uh, this, like the insect trapped inside a stone. So uh, I would now like to ask a good question that um, embodies all these discussions we've been having. So this is a question I would like to address to all panelists as well as to the audience. So what do we do with site-specific art in an increasingly dynamic, increasingly dynamic world? That's, that is my question to you. This is related to your latest uh, comment about migrants and the future and migration that will not only affect small groups, but ultimately all of us. So why don't you uh, go first, please? Well, it is a question to all of us, of course, and as you you made a great point, this this uh, we are the point where I only have questions actually from from the European urban history and theory we have learned. Let's say Aristoteles, he said the urban population has three major groups: those who live here now. And those who have passed and those who will come uh, afterwards, afterwards. All those would have to be taken into account. And this um, migrational aspect, so if you follow the references uh, that impressed me a lot in, in this question, so this is about the younger generations that have a different way of handling things, who do not want to own a home or a car, who know that with digital devices uh, they are highly flexible from on an operational level level, who have maybe a different way of <laughs> orienting themselves, family has a different meaning, etc. So it's really important to not only speak of migration in relation to this underlying uh, misery, uh, think uh, refugees, etc., etc., if you would even like to use these uh, categories in the first place. So we could see these are forced uh, nomads, whether they have papers, 
documents or not, whether they're politically persecuted or not, maybe economic re refugees, as if that weren't political. So all these categories, but now we are taking it further. Es gibt so diese Bewegung. There is uh, this increasing uh, movement. There are more and more uh, people who are on the move, who are um, highly uh, mobile, who have high degree of mobility. And, um, and that's a very decisive question. What happens uh, to uh, this, this site-specific art? But there's also uh, the site-specific aspect to historic events. And this not only refers to monuments, let's say monuments uh, or memorials are not just monu monuments, they are more than that. So what happens to them? Is it just a narrative that you can tell people? And do you appropriate uh, this narrative? So you would have to ask yourself what would have to happen for such a narrative to be appropriated by, to, by somebody who comes from the outside. So many things are, can, are imaginable here. This is not about the existence, whether this will be or or not be, but this is about how or if this will happen at all. And uh, to to translate that into uh, an everyday practice, because these people live somewhere and all these things are flexible and fluid. So mobility um, includes change and an increasing amount of change. And it's probably also a movement that is getting increasingly stronger, more stronger than during the modern era. People weren't that as flexible and mobile as they are today. So if you ask sociologists who used to say, I remember this lady I met here in Vienna and I uh, talked to her, that was 25 years ago. She said, she said she was from 19th district. Her husband had passed. And she wanted to go down, she, she was down in downtown Vienna to see where she had grown up. And that was something very normal in the 19th century for people to not even leave their, their main neighborhood. And this lady um, 25 years ago had actually not left her district in 25 years. So now we are things, humanity, morality, uh, civilization, all that, all those aspects are very different now than they are in the past. They might be highly important in the in the future, but I have no way, no idea of how to go about it. So there might be an accidental interpretation, new variations uh, that uh, from the archives. What Miss Christ said that was I find that very uh, striking. That requires some programs, large scale programs, and not just specific and individual interventions. The, the question is how to adapt that to uh, the uh, to the future and how to offer that to people who have different backgrounds. And for that, we need programs. So uh, the, the space and the location and uh, tra traces that you look for but that don't exist anymore, so it might be... Um, um, uh, it might be art without a specific location, actually. Well, I was just thinking what I, I'm doing is uh, not archiving the present. I'm bringing archives into the present. But I was also thinking about what you said, Mr. Rick, because uh, this retelling of narratives that is uh, not about eternity, but it's some kind of preservation of duration. But that is not tied to a specific place. So that is tied to a person that actually shares that narrative, maybe with uh, their uh, children, etc. So this durability might not be just achieved through archiving in a and that needs uh, requires not only a material aspect, but it goes much further than that. It can be very specific. Just think the nuclear trash that needs to be disposed of, because that's something we uh, knowledge we should have uh, way into the future as well. Um, so this uh, this information really needs to be preserved. Some things are just passed on orally, and some to stories need to be retold over and over again. That was a great way of saying that. So the best memory is this oral history. So, uh, so that um, 
that can last for several generations, and we need to make a chain of um, of this narrative, and that will include all the changes to uh, to a language. So that's the most uh, lively memory and remembrance that we have. That we have yeah. archiving uh, the present uh, locations and spaces that disappear, and art that remains. Yeah. I would like to get the perspective uh, of uh, restore. We are talking about vanishing things. That is something that you also study and explore. But you also make sure that what's vanished can return. Yeah. So what happens if um, the location is not a fixed location anymore? That is certainly a difficult question. It's a philosophical question. And um, yes, there are, and then we need programs. So I would like to pass this question to the artist. So whenever you create an installation for a specific location and that location is gone, what would you do? What would you like to happen for, for your uh, work to happen? So would you like for it to go to the museum? So if the space is gone, it will be difficult to do something for the space. But this is a, pre a pretty striking question. Sometimes it goes, it is about reconstructing uh, this uh, space or this location in one way or another, of making uh, actually a mark on, on the space. So could you maybe create a virtual room to recreate that in a virtual space? Would that be an option? I think there are probably d different options. But you probably wanted me to say something about storage. Um, I have um, a fundamental, a key question here that that, that I have uh, gotten no answer to uh, today. When we purchase art uh, using taxpayers' money, at least for me as a pragmatic person, I do think that there is this uh, commitment or this obligation towards taxpayers to provide some kind of, kind of accountability of what happens to that art that can could be in the form of reports, documentation, you name it. And I do believe that actually that this is a relevant aspect. What do we do with uh, uh, art that we purchase? Because this is different. Uh, it's a different thing if I purchase uh, a uh, work of art with my own money. I think there is a different dimension to it if taxpayer money is used. An additional question here. We have been talking about how the art narrative includes a lot of contextualization, how it is reassessed over and over again. So to what extent does contextualization play a, a role in the practical life of restoring, restoring objects of art? Huh? To what extent is that an issue for you? Let me answer that uh, a question first. Absolutely. This is a key aspect. What a, this fix the problem approach that won't work. So as the first step, we are going to uh, uh, compile to collect all available information about the object of art in question. And if uh, it is a contemporary artist, even before we start, of course, we need to get in touch with the artist themselves to uh, talk to them about what can be done, either a restoration of an object of art. If the, oh, we cannot do that, um, we cannot restore an object of a, of a living artist without getting their consent. Sometimes the artist will say, I will do it myself. In that case, we will just provide assistance and guidance. And we might say, oh, you might want to use this material, which is better, of uh, ages uh, better, but that it will always be the artist's decision. So I think this context needs to be questioned over and over again. Das Depot, uh, die the storage uh, we have... Uh, so, um, 
auch uh, hier und auch das Wort Archivierung. And the, uh, the, the word archiving comes across as a little reactionary. In the past 10 years, the museum landscape in Austria has um, implemented huge uh, storage projects. Also in view of the fact that we have dwindling resources and what I mentioned earlier, that we are probably moving away from individual restorations, even though we need be, to be able to do that. But this will mostly be about preserving collections. And this is why we have um, invested money in large um, um, uh, storage projects in uh, Innsbruck, in Lower Austria, at the regional gallery there. So there have been huge uh, projects. As of today, or today, we are once again questioning these large projects. Because actually we know if we look at the rising energy costs, that's something that, that was mentioned today. So storages and museums with AC, all that costs a lot of money and they use a lot of energy. So in the future, we will also have to find new concepts for that in the future. It's something that we will, we will have to uh, tackle and storage space that is far away and where restorers will uh, be uh, on business trips constantly, that is, of course, a, a questionable approach uh, as well. Um, so I wonder, so this is a question we will have to ask ourselves in the future. So everything is in flux here. And um, yes, sustainability is definitely a priority. We would have to look into that. I wanted to add something here. This, uh, it was mentioned in this narrative about sustainability and narrative uh, and um, energy. So uh, I'll ask you the question, what do we do with site-specific art if the site is lost? And after that, I think we will be uh, taking a few um, questions that have been posted online. So Marie-Thérèse, you can explore this issue from uh, three different angles. You're an architect, um, so you're both an architect and you and you work in in, in art and uh, you also are also a member of the advisory committee and that's why you explore these questions. So uh, are you going to give us three answers or just one? Um, when the art verloren. So if the site, the location is lost, well, the context for which the art uh, was made, I don't think there is a straight answer and a clear answer to that. We have the public space. Also der I think that public space, uh, the public, public accessible public space is something that's subject to constant change. The pandemic has uh, shown us that very clearly. So there have been different uses of public space and we have we saw how relevant public space is for society. And then there, there's this parallel world that's also public, uh, this uh, media dominated um, a virtual public space, as has been said earlier today, this is used, uh, plays a big role in art, in, in the area of art, because there is a huge audience that can be reached. So this uh, is visible and perceptible in our society. And today I had this um, sensation that there are parallel worlds, but where that can support each other. I think that if the location a site is lost for a work of art, then it will be important for that it, this should be traceable, the work of art. It should still be available somewhere. It could be archived online uh, as a knowledge potential. It should be People should be able to find it. Oftentimes, you don't even know why an object of art is, disappears. We heard about um, activism and things that happen in in a uh, context of art, but maybe sometimes even the, the building gets torn down. That's very simple. So I think this documentation of public art 
is uh, a very important element and uh, this retelling of the story of the narrative for and for history uh, to uh, remain present. We need to ensure that. And, and I think then there is different answers to that. Whether it's um, the work of art that goes into storage at a museum, in a collection, or if it's reintegrated into a newly built building, I think that is to be to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. I was wondering if we should um, um, recommend to Big to, cre uh, to create a storage space for um, public art, if they should have something like that. I, I wonder, because there is actually a need for that kind of space, because very frequently um, objects of art that lose their location, they might uh, be valuable or there might be other reasons. So th those... And then uh, these um, works of art could be transferred into this space. So this is one of the big questions for me, if we should recommend having something like that. That's something that we should uh, definitely explore and, and, and look, look into and discuss. Just one suggestion when you talked about documenting. I think that you should have a, just a professional approach as restoring. I've worked on past exhibitions, past objects, but it's very difficult to find professional documentation of those. It's not enough to have an ephemeral memory of something that might have been. No, if we really want to archive and preserve works of art that are considered to be temporary, we will have to document them professionally, describe them professionally. So everything that is normal to us for in museums is not that common for public art. For many, many building-related works of art have not even been documented. This will also need transparency and visibility. We've got so many possibilities, QR codes, and much more to tell us where all this these objects are. So I'm not even talking about lengthening the, their lives, but just about documenting this. Um, we do not have a question, but a suggestion here. It would be exciting um, to hear about the story of the Roscoe images in Harvard, Harvard, which have been restored digitally. So there are even possibilities, digital possibilities of preserving um, other objects. I just wanted to say that I completely agree. If you want to recount something, you need to explain something before. This is where a lot of things are missing. And I also think um, this taxpayer's money item is a very important item. Art, art funding um, has uh, art that has been funded has often been um, destroyed and disposed of just when a building was demolished. And I think there were a lot of um, artifacts that would have been um, worth being cared for. Do we have questions from the audience? We have a room full of experts here today. Uh, 
But vielleicht haben die Frage, ob es einen we might geben soll um, ask ourselves whether we want a cemetery for artworks somewhere in the desert, something whether we want to a place where we want to put them, or if doing that digitally will suffice. I think just like people who come and go and die, I think the same holds true for works of art. They come, they stay, and someday they go. This could be an automatic process. For me, that will be enough. I see what you mean, but the Bruce Sterling, um, a science fiction author and media theorist, um, has a cemetery for hardware that's not no longer needed. That's a digital cemetery. And the same holds true for socialist works of art. They are archived in the real world. There's a collection of sculptures. And there is the Dutch strategy. They um, have disposed of a hundred thousand paintings which um, they didn't use anymore and there was an overproduction for the state and afterwards they used those pictures in a very radical, very strange way. Uh, it was just like waste, but on the, in the wrong space. We could also have an art to take. Maybe um, making it available to municipalities or private persons. Monument. They might be able to um, borrow monuments or other art um, objects that had been um, installed in a site-specific way, but that can also be placed everywhere as well. Would that be something for our artists, a cemetery of work, of artworks? I think that's interesting. In Lithuania, I visited one of those um, statue parks where Stalin and Lenin statues are collected. And I think this was a very interesting venue. I think it's better that they stand, um, they are, are used and placed there than burying them. Even like, like what happened with the Marx head, um, even though there were artists who um, took them out of the earth and then reburied them as an artistic form of expression. But I think an archive is always something important. And these statues are archived in that way that they are all placed at the same time, forgetting a little about them, but they are still here. And in the, past, in the future, it would be possible to go back and um, deal with them again. So this is why I think a kind of cemetery is interesting, but a side, sort of storage would be better. Any sort where you could go back and deal with those works of art again. It's also important to um, see what happens to those works of art when they are taken from the venue where they that they were made for and put into another place. Rediscovering that is very frequent. Site-specific um, work from the um, National Socialist period was um, repainted and then um, the paint was removed again and um, and used to deal with it. So that might be an option as well. I agree. 
we've heard uh, a lot about um, doing away with uh, arts of work, for example. I ask myself whether we are have the competency to decide that. I would think it to be better to have to, to let 50 years or so pass before deciding this this before deciding on this my grandmother hates art nouveau for example and gave all of the her um, furniture to to us um, and we were delighted and i see the same happening with furniture that i gave to my um, family and friends. I went to Albania today, uh, this year, where there's not a cemetery, but a museum and a storage that can be visited, which is really interesting because there are hundreds of Lenin busts thus um, creating an entirely new form. I just wanted to add that the context, public space, is important. What, we talked about what happens when the context is lost. I think that many artwork uh, which is created for the public space really need the public space. Such works of art would not be um, fe feel great in a closed space. I think documentation needs to be great, it needs to be accessible, big, thus this intensively. But we also have to ask ourselves how physical do those artworks need to be when the venue, the site changes? I think we should have mar markings such as memory, um, some sort of memory, some sort of remembrance where um, the past is revoked. I think memory is a very important issue. I personally think that works of art can die and something else can, it can be created. We always try to, to preserve everything, but we could also have a digital storage enabling everybody from everywhere to access it. That's of a very, that's a very great value, and that might even keep alive ideas and enable them to live on. I think you've mentioned a very important point here. We have very strong economic constraints. Not all buildings will be able to be restored, be preserved for economic reasons because buildings are rebuilt again and again. Every building and, and every work of art that vanishes um, together with the building could be remembered that way. But we do not have the means um, to stop this process of Vanishing. Das führt mal so ein bisschen eine technischere Geschichte wäre, dass man vielleicht noch zwei Dinge unterscheidet. Das eine. I suggest we make a distinction between two things. One being this problem of choice or selection. So. We have a clear decision, but in 20 years we might have to say this decision was wrong. Komplett davor zurückschrecken. Would be afraid to ever voice an opinion on what would be useful in a storage or not. The second distinction is public art is not only the art that we talk about that's important aesthetically, but there's also um, 
use used art on jede straßenkreuzung every and at every corner there is a short cycle um, if you go through europe um, you can uh, you can't stop wondering what those circles have brought there are steel constructions um, forms of art etc but i don't even know how what criteria are used to do this but this would be a possibility of um, demolishing one thing, putting up another thing. In France, there is art on the highway, La Porte du Soleil, for example, where there are steel monsters that aren't even interesting. They're cheaply trivial. I'm sorry, I don't... Okay. There are certain um, sa safety measures. Art must not um, must not make people f um, of your presentation. Um, make, must not make people become inattention um, De deviate the attention of people. One, one last question. I just wanted to add that we've had a lot of roundabouts, but then um, we found out that we had to implement all those safety measures, and this is why. Um, People said they do not want public art projects in roundabouts. Lokalen Künstlern, uh, Municipalities and local artists sometimes installed um, art projects, but this is a rather difficult Thema. topic. Most of all because it is just like a piece of exhibition that you go around. So it really is difficult to comply with um, safety measures, not, not have irritating effects, but what is art if not irritating? <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. Are there any more um, requests for the floor? Heidusch Gerngroß said we should have a cemetery. At the same time, I think it would be great to have works of art um, on highways. It's not my place to care about how to preserve those. But it would be, if you go on the highway, you at least see provocative works of art. I think that's a great concept. Thank you for your statement. What do you want me to announce next? <laughs> Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>